you said the other day that this, what I would describe as a bombshell report from Daryl Plekis was just really the hand grenade and that we were going to see, I think you said bombs, bomb a singular or something in the future. Can you expand on that? What do you mean? Uh, well, I would say first off, uh, the, the criminal investigation that the RCMP uh, is conducting and have been conducting for, for a number of months now. Um, I would say that would be, uh, you know, a bigger grenade or a bigger bomb uh, when that when that gets completed. I mean, uh, I can't remember a case in British Columbia where two special prosecutors were assigned. Uh, usually, it's only one. So I think that is significant in itself um, of the of the sheer size of this that that two special prosecutors. So I think that is going to be a bigger bomb. We're also working on uh, one of the special motions that was passed by uh, the Legislative Assembly Management Committee uh, the other day was uh, a workplace review. Uh, we haven't gone looking for these people, but over the last number of months as part of my investigation, uh, a lot of former employees and some current um, have, have come to, to myself and to the Speaker uh, without invitation to let us know about um, what they would call improprieties, they've described uh, corruption, um, they've also described um, being terminated, uh, what they allege to be for asking questions. Um, I did look into some of the cases and, and yes, the, the, these employees were terminated without cause. An alarming number of employees, uh, you know, if you look at, you know, private sector or other public sectors, uh, I, I would argue that there was nowhere near the amount of employees terminated without cause. Uh, given severance and then asked to sign non-disclosures. Uh, yes. They. How, how many? How many people are we talking about? Uh, we're talking upwards of twenty. Twenty people. Yeah. Who were at one point in time employed at the legislature. Right. And you, uh, your understanding now is they were terminated without, without cause. Without cause. And, now, and, and asked to sign non-disclosures. Correct. Uh, but they allege that they were terminated for asking questions and, and I'm not talking about people who were employed part-time or you know for for a short period of time you know some of these employees were, were in the building for 10 years 15 years 28 years uh, and, at, and at some pretty high level positions uh, in a number of different departments um, they allege and, and quote being being instructed don't ask questions um, if you do you're gone what kind of questions were they asking? Uh, questions about, at times, um, financial uh, records, uh, expenses, um, e trips. Uh, they would bring them up and, and some folks, maybe even working in finance at the time, saying, whoa, I, I don't think this is right here, I, I shouldn't be processing this. And again told, no, you won't be asking those questions. Um, asking people to delete documents. Um, I mean, to say it was, it was multiple departments is an understatement. I would say I've spoken to employees from pretty much every department and they all have, they're all saying similar stuff uh, and they haven't spoken to each other. So that to me is, is pretty indicative of this requires further attention. There's, there's no, you know, that's why this, this current investigation took so long. We don't want to be saying anything about anybody unless we are so sure and so on the side of right. It's been asked multiple times, well, why didn't you bring this out last January? Or why didn't you bring it out in November when, when these two individuals were, were escorted off the property? Because we, it doesn't matter who they are, we are not interested in you know, throwing mud at people. We need to make sure we are right. And then when we're sure we're right, we need to go back again and make sure we're right again. When you use the word department, is that interchangeable with the word ministry? Is it across multiple ministries? No, department. So I'm speaking uh, not about government. I'm not speaking about uh, the politics side of the house, um, although we may in the future. I'm speaking purely about the legislature. Uh, so if you're a, a political staffer, you work for that political party, whether it's as a legislative assistant or a ministerial assistant or, or whatever. I'm talking about the folks that work actually for the legislature. Um, so they are employed by the legislature, they do not change with government, they, they do not work, they're non-partisan, they do not work for any political party. Um, so that would include the library staff, that would include Hansard, that would include uh, finance, human resources, all those folks that work for the building. And over what period of time 
or would these have these people come forward and said, "I was once employed there, and now I'm not"? Uh, the the employees started coming forward to me. Um, it would have been early summer, and it it was sort of like a snowball effect. So I meant what period of time were they employed? Like, how far back did this does this scenario go where they feel that they were terminated without cause because they raised concerns about financial? R right. Been happening for five years, ten years. Uh, yeah, I mean, some of them were were terminated, sort of five years ago. Some of them were terminated um, as recent as a year ago, um, and even less. Um, so it's, it's, it's a pretty good sample of, I've worked in the building for 28 years and all of a sudden, you know, I was the greatest employee in the world and then all of a sudden, four years ago or five years ago, I was arbitrarily terminated. Um, but it's, it's over the last sort of five years, six years that these people have been terminated, but, but up to fairly recently, even within the last year. Can you give us a brief overview, please, of, um, of the structure of the legislature and the role of the clerk? and how that intersects or doesn't intersect with MLAs? Certainly. I mean, the clerk is uh, essentially the CEO of the legislature. Um, and, and then sort of the, the, the speaker would be uh, the chair of the board, uh, for lack of a better kind of reference. Um, everything goes through the clerk. The clerk is responsible for the operation, the money, um, the CEO, he runs the place. Uh, the sergeant at arms is responsible for uh, safety and security of the legislature and also MLA offices, uh, constituency offices, as well as facilities um, and that kind of stuff. And then the speaker obviously is responsible for, um, you know, all the employees that work at the legislature. He's the referee in the house, but is also responsible for, you know, the grounds and the, and the legislative buildings themselves. Nothing, the, the legislature for, is essentially the Vatican. Uh, nothing can get investigated. The police can't even come on the property unless they get written approval from the speaker. There has been incidents in the past where police have tried to investigate or come on the property. They have been told, sure, come on the property, and then told by the sergeant at arms, you can look in that box, but you can't look in that box. You can win that office, but not in that office. And if you don't like that, that's the door. Essentially, I could go to the police and say, I just saw somebody steal a million dollars off that table. And the police could go and knock on the front door and the speaker, sergeant at arms and clerk could say, not even close to being interested, turn around and get off our property. And they have to do so. It is literally the Vatican. So when you have these positions, you know, essentially, they can do whatever they want. It's, it's actually a kind of a running joke with employees uh, referencing in the past the clerk, sergeant at arms and speaker as the Holy Trinity. Is it like that in other legislatures in the country? Uh, it, it, it is the same setup. It, it is the parliamentary system. Um, I mean, if, if, if I had my way, I would change it. I would fundamentally change it. You need to make sure these positions are clearly nonpartisan. The speaker by design is nonpartisan. Well, we've never had a truly independent speaker before because the speaker is usually from the governing party. Mm -hmm. Well, to me, that's not really nonpartisan. If I had my way, the speaker wouldn't be even part of a party, maybe not even elected. So how do you how do you do an investigation under that type of scenario? Well, it's been it's been incredibly difficult. It's incredibly complicated. Uh, you know, you're essentially wearing multiple hats and ensuring that, uh, you know, you're not being sort of caught by, by folks that you're investigating because you, they would shut it down in a heartbeat. So that's why it's taken so long. I mean, yes, we want to make sure we're on the side of right. Yes, we want to make sure uh, that we've got all the evidence and information, but it is so incredibly difficult when you're in, it, when you're in that vacuum of, you know, you're an island. It's, so it's been incredibly complicated. The police investigation uh, and any potential future reports from the speaker, are, we, are they necessarily just going to be about expense violations the way we've seen this report largely be about expenses, uh, 
retirement allowances, that type of thing? Or is there a possibility that this investigation can balloon into something larger than that? Yeah, I, w I would say there's absolutely the possibility. Uh, I mean, I don't want to kind of speak for the police. I mean, they'll, they'll investigate, they'll, they'll see what kind, of, what kind of charges are there. Um, but I would suggest, I mean, I know it's been referenced the, the you know, case recently at a national level where it was uh, totally about uh, expenses and essentially the individual in question was, was found not uh, to have done anything criminal, uh, just inappropriate. Well, in this case, I mean, of this report, yes, yeah, some of it will be the same thing. Well, it's inappropriate, probably shouldn't have done it, but it's not criminal. Um, we know that. We, we, we already, we've got that. But when you're talking about, we're not talking about, like uh, was referenced the other day, taking a pen home and, oh, I've got a pen from the legislature. We're talking about you cut yourself a check for $257,000. That's, that's craziness. That is madness. It doesn't matter what way you look at it. But to answer your question about could this balloon into other stuff, I mean, yeah. I mean, I read this as a British Columbian and say, well, what about breach of trust by a public office? That's a criminal offence. Uh, and I know the police, I can certainly uh, confirm that the police are, are looking at expenses, but they're looking at a lot more stuff too. Um, and and when, they, when they are ready, I mean, they're, they are preparing uh, production orders, i.e. Uh, search warrants. Um, they are all over this. And it's not just about you claim per diems when you got a free meal. I mean, that's, we, we needed to... to put all that stuff in the report to clearly demonstrate to people because people just weren't getting it. These individuals were, were off the property November 20th and then the media didn't have much and the public didn't have much so the speaker and I became the story. Uh, so the commitment was made, we will tell you what our concerns were. So the court of public opinion can decide about the expense stuff. Are the police going to touch that? Probably not. I mean it's just, my suggestion would be it's kind of wasting resources. It's the same thing as, as back east where why do we want to spend years and, and all those resources and money just to determine, yeah, well, it's not criminal, it's inappropriate, it shouldn't have happened. No, we don't want that. We want the police focusing on stuff that they feel and the special prosecutors feel there's charges here. Can you give me an example? No, not at this point. Because I would, I would suggest that uh, by the end of February, beginning of March, I think we're going to have an example or two. Um. I'm going to hop around just just a little bit here um, and come back to what you've just been talking about, but I'm just going to try to follow these notes because if I don't, I'm going to forget to ask sure. you something. So that's okay. So if it seems like I'm a little bit jumbled. Um, this report, for the most part, I think if I, if, I, if I wrote this down correctly, looks at expenses between April of 2017 and December of 2018. Right. Is there a plan to do a forensic audit, something that precise? going back earlier than April of 2017? Yes. Um, so when LAMSI met, the Legislative Assembly Management Committee met the other day, there was four motions uh, put forward and, and voted on and passed unanimously. The very first one of those motions was a financial audit. Uh, and we're talking about a forensic audit. Um, we'll start with you know, the past 18 months, but uh, you know, it's referenced in this report about, about an a extremely inappropriate payout back in 2012. Um, I think we have to go back. Um, How far back? Where would you start? I would, well, I would start in 2012 simply because we've already referenced that, that payout in 2012. But, I mean, I would, I would say it's going to take time, obviously, so let's do the last 18 months and then just start working our way back here. Uh, I mean, that, somebody has got to answer for, you know, why the single highest paid public servant in the country is cutting himself a check for $257,000. That's not opinion. That's not speculation. That is fact. We've released those, the, 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 the supporting documents. <laughs> I'm thinking, unless you've got a good excuse for that, I want my money back as the, as the British Columbia taxpayer. I mean, this is madness. Uh, so I would go back there. If that happened in 2012, whoa, what else are we talking about? And also, uh, you know, you talk about the, the, the Holy Trinity and, you know, the, the clerk supposing to be, to be um, independent. Well, over the years of 2012 through the current speaker, 
I, I would. I'd like to see what, what, what other kind of uh, stuff has gone on. And I think the, 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 the public wants to know. Well, that leads nicely into my next question, which is, if I understand correctly, Daryl Plekis said he, he got the feeling something was amiss about 15 minutes after moving into his office. Can you explain why little to no action was taken by previous speakers? Uh, I I can't really speak to to previous speakers. I mean, I know there was certainly friendships not with the previous speaker uh, Emily Reid, but the uh, speaker Barisov. Uh, there was certainly personal friendships there with with he and the and the clerk. I mean, I can't speak to what, and I certainly am not in a position to make any accusations against previous speakers. Uh, what they did or did not know, or uh, all I'm saying is, I was in the building about twenty minutes, and I thought. What is going on here? This is craziness. And I'm not an elected official. And literally, I was brand new in the building, and I figured it out in 20 minutes. What? What? What did you figure out in 20 minutes? What was the first thing you saw that you went? I literally felt like I was in the Vatican. That uh, there's there's one set of rules for MLAs. Obviously, they're on the public record. They are accountable to the public. But there's another seemingly weird set of rules for for this group of you know, table officers or permanent officials where they can, they, they can do what they want. And it's, you know, they walk into a room and they have this air of, I'm here, everybody take notice. And I just thought, this is madness. You work for the public. Uh, so I, I can't really speak to what, what the previous speakers did or did not know. Um, should they have known? Yeah. Yeah, they definitely should have known. Does your investigation so far suggest they did anything with that knowledge? Uh, no, uh, I, we, we are aware that uh, there was a report uh, requested. Um, I know the previous Auditor General, John Doyle, also made, made light of this uh, inappropriate uh, payout that was called a, a retirement allowance. Uh, I think it's, it, it's, it's pretty obvious what happened to him. I mean, he was publicly dragged through the mud and ultimately left the country. Um, so it's not like this stuff hasn't been brought up before. I mean, especially something like uh, a retirement benefit or um, uh, severance payouts for political parties. I mean, there's very clear rules and regulations here. And it's very clear that those rules and regulations were not only not followed, they were clearly broken. Now, I want to just be clear, there's a whistleblower reference to A, B in the report. Right. And you've earlier spoken to me about roughly 20 people who have come to you and said, um, you know, we had concerns in the past. Besides those 20 people, was there anybody else in addition to A, B who you would consider to be a whistleblower in this case? Someone who came to you and said, start looking into X, Y, and Z. Yes. Yeah, uh, but the other whistleblowers, other than AB, were all folks that were employed by the legislature uh, in various departments, like I said, um, saying, look into the inner workings of the actual legislature. I mean, uh, the clerk and the sergeant at arms and then all these other people, they all work for the legislature. AB was a, was a political staffer employed by a political party um, as, a, as a legislative assistant. So that, that was the difference between sort of the 20 people and AB. AB was uh, a legislative assistant saying, I've got something to tell you. It's not about the legislature, it's about a political party and about how they're doing business, but it, it affects the public. Then you've got these other folks who, yes, absolutely, they're whistleblowers saying, when I was employed for the legislature, oh my goodness, are they doing things in, in the worst possible way? So that's sort of the difference between A, B, and these other folks. And will you continue to speak to the other folks and look into their issues? Yes. The speaker, that's what you're doing. Yes. Right now. So there's a, there's a part, the second motion that was passed by Lamsey was a workplace review, and part of that workplace review is, you know, yeah, we need to do better. We we are all about protecting people, looking after people. We're not interested in in a culture of um, you know disrespecting people or harming people. These people need to be made whole, whether that's they come back to their jobs or they, you know, get some sort of compensation or they were just given an apology. They were told, whoa, you know what? That was wrong. You know, a lot of people, I've talked to people who have contemplated suicide because of the way they were treated at the legislature. That's not okay in any way, shape or form. 
in this province or any province in this country. That is not okay. So the workplace review will look at putting in place harassment policies, um, making sure we've got an anti-bullying policy, but also, no, you can't be terminating people for asking questions. We need to look after people. Uh, some people, but again, these are alleged uh, uh, incidents. So again, we need to investigate. We need to look and say, okay, we're, we, we've heard you, now let us look into it because Again, we're not going to start pointing fingers or, or slinging mud unless we've got the documentation and the evidence to back it up. Uh, already, I've, I've been working on, on that side of the house as well. Um, I would say we'll, we'll be able to back that up and then some. So I want to move into trying to understand if besides the clerk and the sergeant at arms, who clearly are the two main people identified in this report, and mention of the two former speakers in the report. Will other people, either currently or, or previously employed by the legislature, be investigated? Um, it's, it's hard to kind of confirm that at this point, I would say much like the police, how they operate, we're going to operate the same way. We'll, we'll go where the evidence takes us. I mean, if somebody calls us, emails us, knocks on our door, of course we're going to listen to them, we're going to meet with them, and then we're going to look at what they're, what they're saying. We will, we will go where that financial audit takes us. We will go where that workplace review takes us. Um, there's already some implications about others, but again, we are not going to be saying anything negative or derogatory about anybody until we are so beyond sure. Um, so yeah, it, it's possible, but, but it's, it's too early to say at this point. Can you talk about whether or not any political figures could become investigated as part of this? Uh, again, I would say it's possible, um, but, but it's certainly too early to say. Um, I mean, I'm, I'm not, uh, certainly not going to call for anybody's resignation or point any fingers or name any names, or even political parties for that matter. Uh, it, it's just way too early to say. I mean, I think from this report, conclusions can be drawn, um, assumptions can be made, uh, but I'm not in a position to publicly say anything about assumptions or, or, or you know, opinions. I need to stick to the facts. I need to stick to what we have so far. And then when we have more facts and more evidence and more information, then we can come out and unequivocally say, yes, it's this person or it's that person. Uh, but I think uh, the general public can read this report and say, okay, I can kind of see where this is going, and they can draw their own conclusions. Near the very, very, very end, it refers, uh, the report is referred to as a preliminary report. I think it's only referenced once in there as a preliminary report. And right. that gives us the idea that you and the speaker, separate from the police, are going to carry on. Absolutely. Do we expect more of these? Yes. Yes. I mean, I think... At this point, now that the public has read this, I think they want us to, to keep going. Um, they realize that we've got one motive and one motive only, and that's doing the right thing. Uh, it's protecting the, the British Columbian taxpayer. Um, and we need to change the culture. We need to get to a place where we don't just talk about transparency. We are actually transparent. I mean, what a concept. Because everybody says, oh, we're so transparent. No, we're not. We need to do a better job. And it's not, gonna, it's not self serving for me. It's certainly not self serving for the speaker. I mean, we have taken the proverbial kicking for, for two months straight, dragged through the mud, but that's okay because it's not about what can we get out of this. British Columbia deserves better. Is it possible, we, you know, we in the newsroom started to try to tally up the money that was already identified in this report? Can you at all project? How much money in total we might be talking about once we have all of the allegations together? That well, <coughs> excuse me. That now and in the future, I mean, are we talking hundreds of millions of dollars? Or well, I would say, I would say probably. I mean, it it just totally depends on how far back we go. I mean, for this report is based on eighteen months, and it's in the millions of dollars. When you look at everything together, um, inappropriate uh, vacation payouts, the the expenses, the you know, benefits, all that kind of stuff. We're, we are into the millions of dollars for 18 months. So if we go back even to 2012, 
Well, I mean, if we do the math there, we're talking about tens of millions of dollars, maybe more. So it just depends on how far back we go. Um, yeah, it, it, but we're talking about a lot of money, a lot of money. A lot of taxpayer money. A lot of taxpayer money. Um, am, am I to understand the report correctly that the first time you and the speaker met with the RCMP was September the 27th? The first time you reached out to them and said, I, I think we've got a problem. The first time we reached out to them was before that. Um, it would have been a very early discussion in July. The September reference is we had an actual document about 15 to 20 pages long, really detailing you know, our core concerns. That was the September, we actually reached out prior to that. Did something uh, happen that made you make that initial reach out in July? I think, uh, I mean, we, we were looking at this since, since last January. And, and again, just gathering information, doing our due diligence. I mean, so much was made of, we're doing an investigation. Well, I don't know what else it could be called. We were doing our due diligence. Um, but that was going on since January. There was, I mean, there was a couple of key things that really said, we, we've, we've got to stop here. This is just craziness. I mean, the 257K, I keep on coming back to that because that, I mean, my head almost popped off when I saw that. I just, I, I still can't believe it. I can't understand it. And I don't know why, you know, the people aren't out on the streets screaming. You know, it's been referenced. There's British Columbians that, that can't, buy breakfast for their, themselves and their families, and you've got somebody earning $350,000 a year, craziness in itself, uh, saying, oh, you know, I, I, I need a, a, to cut myself a check for $257,000. And then recently goes to the speaker and tries to get another $300,000 check. Tries to get a million dollar life insurance policy. <laughs> Excuse me? So who do you phone? Who, do you pick up the phone and call Victoria PD, or who do you phone? Who do you call? Uh, we did have discussions with Victoria PD, um, the you know, with the chief, just to you know, again, what way would you go with this? There was a, a discussion about jurisdiction, uh, whether it be Victoria PD, whether it be the RCMP, whether it be a joint thing. Um, so, and again, we wanted to get advice. We wanted to get legal advice from from our lawyers. We wanted to get uh, advice from the police as as to what was the best way to move forward. Um, but ultimately, uh, we, we discussed it and, and said, yeah, okay, it's going to be the RCMP uh, jurisdiction. Um, so yeah, we had, the, we had preliminary discussions with them. They uh, advised us which uh, sort of unit would be, would be looking after something like that. Can you just tell me generally, do you have a sense that the RCMP is working hard on this case? I would say they are working round the clock. I just cannot say enough good about the RCMP. Um, I know a lot of people, especially in the general public, are looking at this saying, well, you know, they, they've had this file since September. Why haven't they even come out and, and referenced it? Uh, why haven't they given us any information? It is because they are being so diligent. They are paying attention to every single detail. And I, I cannot say enough good about the work and the job that the RCMP are doing. Uh, it is over the top. They will come out when they feel they have all the information to give to the public, but are they working hard on a scale of one to ten? A thousand. You were quoted earlier this week saying that the Speaker had turned over allegations to the RCMP that are not contained in this report. Correct. Can you elaborate? I can't because I would, would never want to do anything to impede or thwart the, the uh, police investigation. There's, there's items that were turned over. Uh, they will investigate those items. They will decide whether they are charge-worthy or not. They will decide whether they are of a criminal nature or not. I mean, there's three columns here. There's some stuff that could be, could be criminal, that may or may not be, I don't know. There's stuff that is simply inappropriate. And then there's stuff that is against policy and procedure. So they're the three columns that I think we're looking at. The police and special prosecutors will look at that first column. We will turn over information, being the speaker and I, but it's up to the police and special prosecutors whether they fall into that first column or not. I can't decide that. All I can do is, here's the information, you folks decide that's your, that's your expertise, and then I'll deal with these other two columns. And that's what this report is dealing with, those other two columns. Do you believe there'll be criminal charges in this case? Uh, again, I don't know. I don't know because, I mean, it's such a, 
a complex and complicated uh, set of circumstances. Uh, you know, and, and also, as soon as you have a, a special prosecutor involved, we've got two, uh, it's, it's difficult to get charge approval. Um, so maybe, I don't know. Uh, and again, that, you know, um, it's just not my area of expertise. So I would definitely just, you know, advise and as, as frustrate, frustrating as it is for the public and for us, we just got to be patient and let the, let the police do their job, let the special prosecutors do theirs, and we'll see if there's going to be charges or not. Why are there two special prosecutors? I think because there's so much here, uh, and there's so much that may be criminal, but also there's so much that it's, whoa, this is, this is just, you know, so bloody inappropriate, and it's so, it may not ever see the light of day in a courtroom, some of the stuff, like even stuff in this report. Special prosecutors are paying attention to the stuff in this report too, because the, the, the taxpayers are being affected here. So that's why there's special pros two special prosecutors, because this is so big and so important and affects every single British Columbian. Uh, they just felt that one, one special prosecutor wasn't enough. Like, this is just too much information. Have there been search warrants? Currently, no. Will there be search warrants? My understanding is there will be. Can't elaborate on that? Uh, well, I mean, like, uh, the, the RCMP, again, want to be on the side of right. I mean, if they wanted this document, uh, it, it is within the Speaker's uh, role that he could just give it to them. He can say, yes, you can come on in, you can have this document. Um, they don't even want to do that. They want to do production orders if they want to, you know, take a document or an email or whatever the case. They, again, want to be so on the side of right on this one. Um, so, uh, they, they, if they want to, do, to, to take anything out of the building, they want to do so by way of production order, which is a search warrant. It's possible, though, there could be search warrants directed to places other than the ledge. Is that possible? Uh, I, think, I think it's fair to say anything is possible at this stage. I mean, uh, the ledge is the focal point and the centre of this report, but again, the RCMP will, will go wherever the uh, information and the evidence takes them, and yeah, certainly that could take them to other places aside from the ledge or Victoria. Um, I just want to clarify uh, if you if you actually in the case of this in throughout this investigation if you interviewed anyone who actually saw the eight thousand dollars worth of alcohol being loaded onto the truck. Yes. Because the report doesn't make it that clear. The report says that you didn't have anybody with first-hand knowledge but you're saying that you have now spoken with someone yes. who has first-hand knowledge. Right. Uh, it is the most bizarre, what well, is not the most, it's one of the most bizarre paragraphs in the report. Can you explain to us what was happening, why it was being loaded? Uh, I mean, I can't really because I wasn't there, but uh, basically, I mean, alcohol is bought by the legislature, by government house, and it is totally legitimate. Uh, it's, it's itemized, it's catalogued, it's bought for, you know, conferences or, or functions or whatever the case. That's not the issue. The issue is when you have reports of the clerk of all people being the CEO of the institution, uh, having his personal vehicle loaded up with box loads of, of alcohol. Um, that's alarming, that's concerning, I'm not sure in any way, shape or form how that would be appropriate. I mean, it's appropriate that it was purchased. Uh, it's appropriate for what reason it was purchased. It was purchased for, like I said, conferences or functions or whatever the case. When those conferences or functions are done, the standard procedure would be that alcohol would be catalogued and stored in, in the vault, or it would be returned to, to where it was purchased from and, and a refund would, would be obtained. Not loaded into the personal vehicle of the clerk or anybody else for that matter. Uh, so, very alarming, uh, you know, and two truckloads in your personal vehicle filled with, with booze belonging to the legislature, i.e. the British Columbia taxpayer. Uh, and you now have a witness who can provide information about yes. that exchange. And do we know where the alcohol was headed? Uh, like it was referenced in the report, um, it was, it was referenced by, and I mean, that, that, I'm not giving you any, anything that not contained in the report. I mean, we've got people who said, I loaded the truck. I helped load the truck. 
and the information that we got again the speaker wasn't in the building neither was i when this happened but um, it was referenced for some reason that the clerk was bringing it to former speaker bill Barasov's residence um, i don't know if that happened i don't know if that's the case but that was referenced by actually a number of people that it was being taken by the clerk and being brought to uh, Speaker Barasov's. What did the current speaker do with the now infamous cabinets of liquor that were in his office when he moved in? So there's, when he first got uh, into the office, he was looking around and said, what's going on here? You know, fresh water and, and ice and flowers and all oh, that's changed every, every, you know, twice a day and this kind of stuff. And then he opens the, the cupboard and there's, liquor of every kind it, you name it it was in there expensive scotch and the whole bit and he he took the bottle and said whoa this is expensive scotch oh mr speaker if that's not to your liking you just let us know what is <laughs> and he's looking around saying what are you talking about this is crazy so what the one of the first things he did as speaker was he got a former auditor a former member of the the auditor general's office uh, recently retired to come in and do an audit on the speaker's office uh, he said, I want to not only, you know, be doing the right thing and be on the side of right here, quote, I want to set an example and I want to be an example for government. And he said to that former auditor, everything, the way I do business, the way I pay my staff, the, the type of staff I have on the payroll, the alcohol, all of that kind of stuff. And he said to the auditor before the auditor started, he said, whatever your recommendations are, I'll take them, I'll follow them. So, again, it's, it's historically, and I mean, I don't know if there's much wrong with this. I mean, maybe the average British Columbian may have an issue with it, maybe not. But, you know, it's, it's kind of normal that the speaker would have alcohol in his or her office. Uh, anytime any visiting dignitary comes, their first stop is not the Premier's office, it's the Speaker's office. Um, heads of state, consul generals, uh, VIPs, whoever. Um, so that's, I think traditionally why the booze would be in the office um, but since uh, Daryl Plekis has become speaker zero dollars have been spent on alcohol zero not one bottle of scotch or other alcohol has been purchased by this speaker in the last year and a half not one he's got a big load to get through I guess well it's it's pretty much he got rid of a lot of it uh, is there still booze in there yeah yeah, there is, but you know, at the end of the day, if he or I or anybody else wants, uh, want, wants to have a drink, we'll buy our own drinks. Uh, I don't know why anybody would assume that the British Columbia should be buying meat booze. Uh, so zero dollars has been spent. You and the speaker have taken heat for the perp walk, right. the Clark and the Sergeant of Arms. We've seen the evidence you've gathered against them, but was that necessary? 100% it was necessary. Uh, so it's been suggested that we, that we could or should have perhaps talked to them first thing in the morning or the night before and said, don't come to work. If it was any other employee, we could have done that. Because these two individuals are permanent appointed officers, there is literally no other way it could have been done because it had to be a motion in the House and it had to be voted on by all the members of the Legislative Assembly. The Legislative Assembly didn't sit until 10. That vote happened approximately 10.30. They couldn't go anywhere. They couldn't be told to stay home. They couldn't be told you're on administrative leave at all in any way, shape or form until that vote happened in the House. As soon as that vote happened in the House, it was unanimous. Only then could they be informed you're, you're being placed on administrative leave with pay and they'd be escorted off the property. Now, with regards to the public shaming or, you know, making a spectacle of them, both Mr. Lenz and Mr. James were offered to go out a side door, to go out a back door. We said, we will go to your office and get whatever personal item it is you, you need, your keys, your code, whatever the case. You will not, you'll avoid the media, uh, you'll avoid any employees, it'll be sort of quiet, private. Both. Mr. Lenz and Mr. James said, no, we will do it ourselves. We'll go to our own office. We will go down the very public speaker's corridor. Uh, that was their choice. We were not interested in any way, shape or form of a public shaming or ridiculing uh, or perp walk, as it's been referenced. Uh, 
they chose to, to do it uh, contrary to our offer and they chose to stop and talk to media for eight or nine minutes. Again, that was their choice. And the third thing of, that's been you know, referenced of, oh, well, you had uh, Victoria Police there, so that was part of the perp walk. Yeah, and I would do it again. And that was my choice. Why? Well, first of all, they were, they were plainclothes officers with respect to the public shaming. They weren't in uniform. Why were they there? Because the sergeant at arms is armed. So you have an individual in the speaker's office with a sidearm being told he's being placed on administrative leave. Nothing personal against Mr. Lenz. But do we have a responsibility? Yes, we do. And what is that? Safety and security of that place and everybody within it. So of course I'm going to have armed Victoria police officers there just in case. You've got an individual who's being told some pretty devastating information who happens to be armed. Uh, yeah, of course I'm going to have plainclothes officers there to ensure the safety and security of the building and everybody within it. Leads me nicely to my next question, which is, Daryl Plekis and by extension you have ruffled some pretty important feathers uh, in the last year. Do you feel fear for your own safety? Have you received threats? Uh, we have, we have received uh, some threats since November 20th. Um, the police are aware of them. Uh, they're usually, you know, sort of from an anonymous uh, source or, or, you know, they can't really be tracked or traced. Um, I find it a little bit disappointing and saddening that, you know, for that two months, um, people didn't sort of give us uh, the benefit of the doubt or wait for the supporting documentation. And when I say people, I'm talking about people uh, such as the leader of the official opposition, the house leader for the official opposition, publicly making statements about uh, the speaker and I personally, that we are, uh, I was referred to as a, an amateur policeman running around the speaker's office or Keystone Cops or Dick Tracy. Um, and they were the kind comments. Um, I, think, I think comments like that fueled uh, this this notion or this this idea that somehow the speaker and I were doing something wrong or untoward or we were we were doing this for personal gain or personal benefit um, and yeah there, there was times where he and I had some pretty the speaker and I had some pretty kind of conversations about the what ifs uh, about getting you know death threats and it's it was not helpful to have members of the legislative assembly who were elected publicly saying uh, damaging uh, and personal attacks about the speaker and myself. Um, that wasn't helpful at all. I, I felt that fueled it and I found that to be incredibly disappointing. Um, can you elaborate at all? There's a, there's a small portion in the report um, in which uh, the clerk, Craig James, is, is uh, quoted saying that um, Excuse me. If, if they, meaning the Liberals, had taken issue with his expenses, uh, he could put an end to it because he, quote, had so much dirt on the Liberals, mm -hmm. end quote, and that he could threaten to start, quote, stop paying their legal bills or quit paying their severance payments, end quote. Can you elaborate at all on what he was talking about there? Um, yeah, I, that was a conversation that happened with, uh, with the Speaker and the Clerk, and it was in reference to, uh, again, claiming per diems that the Speaker said, no, like, not into that, or the suit, you know, you know by purchasing these items and then saying, uh, oh, that's okay, we'll expense it, it's part of the uniform. No, a, a watch that says House of Commons on it is not part of your uniform, sorry, but yet he still expensed it. So, referencing an item like that, or, or a suit that the, the Speaker purchased, the speaker said to the clerk, well, no, like uh, the, the liberals are watching me more than anything because, you know, they have a personal issue with me. So I wouldn't want to be doing anything, you know, to, to have them on my back. And the clerk's reply was, don't worry about the liberals. If they even say anything about it, I'll, I'll, I'll quit paying their legal, legal bills. I got so much dirt on them. And the speaker's like, um, the clerk in the clerk's office is nonpartisan. Why would you be paying out of your budget legal bills. That just makes no sense. 
but the comment was made. Um, with regards to severance payments, uh, there, it's referenced in the report of inappropriate severance payments. Severance payments once is good. That's, that's within the rules and regulations, uh, i.e. when government changes. So when they moved over to opposition, obviously positions are going to change. There's going to be people let go. Uh, and that's normal. They get paid severance. Not three times since the last election. Three times separate when, first of all, when, when the, the change happened, then when the interim leader uh, came and went, and then when the new uh, leader came. That's, you can't do that. Unless, of course, you just do it anyway. So that's what that's referencing. Multiple severance payments. Yes. To people within the Liberal Party. Correct. Is that going to be something that will be a focus of future investigation? Uh, I think that will be, that will probably, I would say, more than likely fall under the financial audit. Like if you do a, for a forensic audit, that will, that will absolutely have to be looked at because if it's part of coming from a budget of the Legislative Assembly and not a political party, then obviously it's going to be, it's going to be scrutinized under a, a forensic financial audit. What concern do you have, if any, about this recall campaign, campaign that the Speaker is facing? <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, well, first of all, my concern is why would any British Columbian, it's not just because I work with uh, the Speaker, it's not because we're, we're friends or we have a history. I look at this as a British Columbian and I say, of all the people you want to recall, you're going to pick the guy who is independent, nonpartisan, and I think has proven he is all about working for British Columbians, truly working for British Columbians and the taxpayer. Why would anybody in their right mind even contemplate doing a recall on that individual? Well, the sympathy, right, was with James and Lance. Right. Thing, right, but I mean, I think, I think the only people that would want him recalled are the folks uh, for, from his former party. Um, I think it's important to remember, yes, he was elected as a Liberal. He did not leave the Liberal Party. He was booted from the Liberal Party. There must be something at risk, though, if he is recalled, right? I mean, is this not going to jeopardize the... Yeah, I mean, it, it, I, think it's, I think it's, face, it's uh, fair to say that if that recall campaign was successful, uh, which I can't imagine anybody supporting it, but if it was, I mean, this stops, this goes away. You no longer have an independent speaker in, in the chair. Uh, this investigation goes away. Uh, because then we're back to the Vatican, the don't come on the property unless you have permission from the speaker. Uh, you know, we, everything goes behind closed doors again. Is there any concern that you have at all that any of the evidence gathered by you and the speaker could somehow be uh, challenged in court because at the very, as this report admits at the very beginning the speaker himself was signing off on some of these expenses right um, is there a concern that that could muddy the waters down the line no I don't think so I mean there's there's a lot of stuff everything is backed up by documents there there is some uh, expenses that he signed off on that were legitimate there I mean there as much as there, there's illegitimate expenses, there are legitimate expenses that he did sign off on. Uh, some he signed off on and then later, uh, you know, recalled those and said, no, whoa, I shouldn't have signed that or, or I'm rescinding that, that approval or whatever the case. There's also um, receipts where he, he has signed off on it on, a, on an approval form and then that form was photocopied and attached to other receipts. So there's, there's supporting documents of that too. So no, I think... Anything that is in it, that a company binder of evidence, I mean, we have done so much due diligence and we have so much proof on that. I don't think the, muddies, the, the waters are going to be muddied at all, to be honest. Okay. So what are we going to hear from next, from you and from the Speaker's office? What can, we, what can the public expect to hear next from you? Uh, well, I mean, as information comes out, we will obviously make it public. Um, the, the, the public has shown that they have a, a tremendous amount of interest in this and what we're doing. Um, I think... I think the pu public now gets it that we're just all about looking after them and, and trying to do the right thing. We're going to continue that. Uh, I think the financial audit will be of great interest and we will obviously be doing a report on that. The workplace review that LAMSI has ordered, we'll be reporting on that. Um, any information that the police uh, give us and, and uh, advise us that we can share, we will be doing that as well. Um, but we're not stopping.
Uh, we, we, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't assume we're done. Uh, we're not even close to being done. How big could this get? I think this could be turned into the single biggest uh, item in Canadian political history. Can you elaborate? Well, this is just not going to stop with this report. I mean, usually things are one-dimensional or about one specific issue. Um, you know, the the previous things, the Bassi work, the the BC Rail, the they're they're one specific item and issue. Well, this is not one specific item or issue. This is a huge collection of items and issues and we're going to keep going because everybody needs to know and we need to fundamentally change how we do business we need to be transparent we need to have the public decide and the public aware